All right, if you can see me and hear that we are ready to get going. It's a real pleasure to be here with you um, because this is a topic very near and dear to my heart uh, as an educator, as somebody who is uh, very much interested in your success, right? Um, and in, um, in your purpose and your career path going forward, the future of work is a very meaningful topic because uh, it is uh, changing dramatically and we are here today to explore what exactly is changing. Uh, hopefully, HALT can play a role in helping you equip yourself for what is coming uh, down the road. Uh, as we have been studying the subject intensively, as we have been experimenting with new types of pedagogy, new, new types of skill building, and as you see here, there couldn't be any better timing for that uh, than, uh, than today. Um, we are going to talk about the future of work um, because you spend a lot of time at work, right? Whether it's eight hours or it's uh, 10 hours or 12 hours, uh, you spend uh, most of your waking day at work and uh, you want to feel purpose, you want to have impact, you want to have success. We're here to help you achieve those goals, okay? Uh, that said, uh, things are changing. Automation is setting in. Uh, we are looking at uh, the fourth industrial revolution as a true revolution. By definition, revolutions uh, are a at least 10x change from what we're used to. Uh, and I think that's what we're looking for, looking at here today. Um, as AI kicks in, as, uh, the, uh, as automation, as the fourth industrial revolution kicks in, um, we need to grapple with the fact that, uh, that these smarter machines are increasingly making decisions, conducting certain types of work on our behalf, and that our job profiles uh, are changing, that our, uh, uh, that our income potential is changing, um, that our career paths are changing. And of course, we want to exercise control over that or some degree of control over that and shape that as we go along. So we need to look at the machine in the smart machine in a new way if we want to define ourselves uh, uh, with that smarter machine in the picture. And I'm here uh, today to talk to you about what the future to be. Um, and that future is uh, human machine symbiosis, right? We as humans do certain things that no machine can do really well, and machines can do things that we really cannot do well. And so we are getting into a new kind of relationship uh, in which both sides need to bring what they're innately good at and then play at a higher productivity level because our collaboration with the smarter machine needs to be measurable, right? The output needs to be measurable a productivity gain needs to be measurable. So how do we do that? Well, let me first create a bit of sense of awareness here for you by showing you a quick video. This is a World Economic Forum video uh, that interviews various thought leaders that I'm in touch with uh, about uh, you know, what they see the impact of automation to be. It's just a couple of minutes, and I'll use that as a bit of a stepping stone to have an exchange, okay? So listen carefully. For the last two or three centuries, there is always this fear the machines are taking over. I don't think anyone can irresponsibly say, oh, don't worry, it, nothing will happen to jobs. This time it, it might be true. The world's people say they're not overly anxious about technology. They are deeply, deeply anxious about their jobs. AI will impact jobs. Like we don't know what's going to come. We don't even know what new inventions are going to be. To reinvent yourself when you're 20, it's difficult, but you do it. To do it again at 30, at 40, at 50, that's very high levels of anxiety. But so what are we left to do then? What are we left to do then? It's easy to imagine the predicted 66 million people poised to lose their jobs to machines, muttering the same refrain. The OECD, the intergovernmental organization that came up with that figure, estimates that 14% of jobs could be automated in industrialized countries. And though machines are most immediately coming after manufacturing and agricultural jobs, even work requiring more specialized skills could increasingly fall to automation. Goldman Sachs's chief financial officer reported that their U.S. cash equities trading desk employed some 600 traders back in 2000. All but two of those positions had become automated by 2017. 
In these increasingly uncertain times, we ask the experts what jobs will be created and what jobs will disappear. There'll be some disintegration and some creation of jobs. 50 years ago, we could not have thought of software engineering as a job. Today, the whole Silicon Valley is full of that labor force. First, obviously, it will create AI jobs, right? People who program AI, people who fix robots. But in terms of quantity, is a very, very small quantity. We will see jobs more related to interaction with intelligent machines. Where it's symbiotic between the man and machine. The human can do things that the machine cannot do, and the together, they do better. Freeing labor from dangerous, repetitive work. I suggest every professional, whether you're a lawyer, accountant, think about tools that emerge and how that makes you two, three, four times stronger, better, and, and richer, for that matter. People talk so much about replacing humans, but I think the goals of AI machines should be actually more assistive. But to be really honest, professional Professional jobs are still a small proportion of the total jobs. To a large extent, blue-collar jobs will be replaced by machinery. Bank teller, receptionist, customer service, drivers, and uh, even radiologists, relatively high-end, more complex uh, jobs are going to eventually get replaced over the next 15 to 20 years. The routine job replacement is huge. Humanity has seen this over and over again. Every industrial revolution is a huge disruption of jobs. I think it easily accounts for half of our jobs. Different people have different views about whether this, these half of the jobs will take 10 years or maybe 30 years or 40 years to be replaced. But even 40 years is faster than industrial revolution. The experts agree that though technology has disrupted the nature of work in the past, at no point in history has the transformation been so rapid and extensive. And that speed means workers must stay nimble and continue learning new skills throughout their working lives. I think that there will be new jobs. The big question is whether people will be able to reinvent themselves to fill these jobs. Okay, let me, uh, let me pause the video here and... Um, <clears throat> And, and start to explore some of this a bit, a bit more, okay? And here's what I'd like you to do. Um, uh, I would like you to type into the chat, um, you know, a, a, a phrase or so in uh, how you think this will impact the current job you're in, okay? Just don't, don't write a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of poetry. Just give me a few words that give us a bit of an impression as to where you see this impacting you, okay? I'm going to monitor the the chat function here to see um, to see what we're getting. Okay. It will make some tasks easier, most definitely. Yes, right. There are some routine tasks that are quite hard physically, uh, very much so. Yeah, uh, efficiency, uh, lots of efficiency gains there. Uh, I'm seeing. Let's see. Uh, more, more emphasis on personal contact. Uh, certainly, that may have been a teacher or somebody who knows a bit about teaching. Uh, the, you know, AI and automation can free you up uh, to focus more on what really matters between people. Learning could become easier when machines understand us better. I saw that as well. Very good. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot on optimization and efficiency, of course. Better outcomes. It is true that we're seeing this, uh, for instance, in, in certain areas of medicine, that more AI assistance actually makes doctors better and, and more effect, effective. Um, let's see, uh, fewer errors, that goes to the same point, yes. Uh, let's see, uh, faster production, that goes to efficiency, yeah, okay. Cannot replace relationships, uh, I like that one. Yes, we're gonna talk about that one. Um, and more uncertainty, most definitely, that's why we're here. I also saw uh, total cost of ownership of the human asset, very sophisticated comment. Uh, absolutely, that is in fact part of what we're going to be coming back around to. Okay, humans being viewed as uh, economic assets, of course. Yeah, um, okay, so we're seeing a lot of good comments here. Uh, you, you feel free to keep them coming. Um, but I want to sort of bring it to, uh, to a head here and move us on to, based on what I just heard from you, 
move us on to, uh, to really what the most important question here is of them all, okay? And that is, what role will the human play in the future? Because you already have told me now that the human, whoops, uh, that the human is, a, um, is an economic asset. Uh, you know, we are always striving to become more and more efficient. We are being measured very clearly. Our productivity is being measured, maybe not every day, but more and more often. Uh, and yet, you know, I also saw the other side, which is that, you know, we are maybe freer, more free to deal with people in a people appropriate way, to have more time and to really focus on what matters most. Okay. That is actually exactly the tension that we are facing today. Okay. <clears throat> And it all starts with one big observation. And that big observation is that we are uh, gr uh, growing our data economy tremendously, exponentially over the next five to 10 years, right? So if you look at where we are today, that's 2019. If we look at where we're going, if we are going to be looking at a data economy of about 173 or so zettabytes of data by 2025. Now, a lot of that data is driven by um, machinery out there, by uh, smarter cars, by factory equipment, uh, by facial recognition cameras. And it sounds as though what I'm telling you is that these are all bricks and mortar uh, elements of, uh, of our, the world around us, right? Making things safer, making them uh, uh, may maybe uh, more upgradable, making them easier to maintain, right? Uh, getting some advance warning on what types of equipment are breaking down, et cetera. Um, maybe making, you know, certain types of consumer electronics, um, uh, you know, equipping those with sensors and, uh, and getting the manufacturer better data on how the electronics is used, thereby making better product in future, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is true, of course, and it misses one other big trend that we are seeing, and that is that we are also part of this picture. We are now getting into our brains. I call this inside out. We are getting inside the brain in order to bring out new insights and of course, to put new stuff into the brain, right? You guys have heard of brain computer interfaces. Elon Musk has started this year with human trials, closely monitored of course, by the medical authorities in the United States and elsewhere. And he himself is saying, I know this is going to take a long time because this is scary to many people, right? And think about the potential. If we can understand the human brain better by understanding what's happening inside, that could be a phenomenally good thing, both in terms of helping people such as trauma patients become uh, and lead richer lives again, but also understanding what intelligence is, what consciousness is, how we are creative, innovative, how ideas happen, and therefore how we can be more productive. But think about what this means. We, are, uh, we have about 100 billion neurons in our brains. That is about the same number of neurons as we have stars in the universe. And while that's a nice coincidence, all that is to say that it's a huge number of neurons in our brains. These neurons function like uh, IP addresses, right, in your computers, in your monitors, in your cars, in your smart home, in your iPhone, or in your, in your smartphone, whatever brand it may be. Okay, and those are those 100 billion neurons in our heads by us going into those heads are now collide uh, the 340 trillion, trillion, trillion IP addresses that we already are steadily walking toward on the outside of our brains, right? In the infrastructure of our daily lives. Now, you do the math 100 billion neurons times 340 trillion, trillion, trillion IP addresses. That is an insane amount of information. That, of course, is not all clear and clean yet, but eventually, with the help of artificial intelligence, it will be. And what that means is that we ourselves are becoming part of the global data infrastructure, and that influences how we are relating to other people, relating to our work, how we're getting work done, and how we are being productive, okay? 
Um, this impacts all of us, including yours truly here giving this webinar. Who you see, what you see here on the left is me sitting in one of the Holt classrooms in Dubai with a team of executive MBA students. Uh, I love coaching, I love mentoring uh, as a big part of my teaching because you can get more up close, personal, and really make sure that knowledge gets transferred and it becomes wisdom, not just information. And so this is an integral part of who I am, but now we are seeing the stuff on the right here, which are smart computer games, such as the ones that I just piloted here at Halt because we are very much looking to innovate on pedagogy. How do we now augment the professor with his very human skills and augment him with artificial intelligence, with smart learning games that have certain advantages themselves, right? Because you can customize a learning experience to the individual with a smart game that can go at your pace, that can serve up different scenarios based on your learning style. Both are immensely important. And the question is, where is the delineation? Where is the collaboration between the two, between the human and the smart computer game or the AI in this case. This is incidentally why um, I am, uh, why I have written this book uh, called Solomon's Code with my good friend, Mark Nitzberg, who is a scientist at uh, UC Berkeley here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I have brought the Holt expertise of strategy and uh, visioning and of innovation of economics to his craft as a scientist. And we've written this book that essentially explores what you just heard Kai Fu Lee say, which is that it's all about um, that it's all about the symbiosis between humans and machines. Many of us at Halt are going out and are testifying in front of political bodies on the left. We are going in front of the media in order to explore this because many of us feel that this has not yet gotten enough attention on a deep enough level, right? It's overhyped and underexplored, uh, okay? So let's talk about what I think we need to look at. If you're looking at this picture, it, it is essentially a production run in a factory of a certain type of hardware. Let's focus on the blue box in the middle. That blue box could be the light bulb right above your heads as you're sitting here listening to me, and that light bulb is smart. And it no longer contains just information about its own semantic space, meaning its own uh, production details, the cost structure, or how often it needs to be upgraded, or how bright it is supposed to shine, right? Now, it will also capture your personal identity, your health, who you are communicating with, what you're doing every day, when you are moving into different rooms in your house, or uh, whether you're using public transportation or your car to get to work or to school, because on the outside of your house, there are other smart lamps, okay? So what I'm trying to tell you is that we are now becoming part of the product. With our identity, with our data, with our creativity, we're bringing all of this in to the production process, the productive process, as we are creating the digital nervous system uh, of our economy. Our brains, our personalities, our emotions, our physical movements are all becoming part of the digital sphere. That brings us to the machine, right? How do we deal with that kind of smart machine and bring the best of what we are into that relationship because it's already capturing us, okay? For that, we have to understand that artificial intelligence is now coming together with brain computer interfaces and it's starting very early days still, make no mistake about it, but it's starting to become turbocharged to speak in automotive terms by quantum computing. We may still be 10 years away for mass rollout for quantum computing, but first trials with IBM, Google, Microsoft, and others, and some, uh, uh, some, some great startups that we study at Holt, are, uh, they're already underway. And they are coming together in this triad of AI, BCI, and quantum computing in order to, uh, to, to enable certain types of modeling that we couldn't do before. What kind of modeling? Well, for instance, modeling on our emotions, modeling on our cognitive processes. We are now starting to understand human emotions better 
observe, and we can model, okay? This is very much starting to happen now. What you see here are psychotherapy bots. They were developed by startups in the United States and elsewhere, uh, sometimes in conjunction with psychiatrists, psychologists, but also military doctors, because soldiers in the battlefield are often traumatized and they cannot get any psychological counseling. Incidentally, one of these psychotherapy bots is now available on Facebook. It's called Wobot, and it will be able to understand uh, what your current state of mind is. It cannot, cannot go very deep, but it can tell you when it thinks you need to call a professional. Now, the very same technology is now being used when you're interviewing for jobs out there, for the kind of jobs that we at Halt want to get you ready for, okay? And they're going to analyze your facial expressions, your intonation, the words that you choose, of course, the content is important. Your gait, for instance, as, you're, as you may be standing up or walking, uh, all of that can be analyzed now with artificial intelligence to see whether you are a good productivity enhancing match for a particular employer. That's of course a great thing because we want you to get a job that fits you. The employer wants you to have a job that you know is uh, where you perform well so they can offer better products to the customer. So it should be a win-win all around. In fact, some of our very own alumni are now getting into this space. Beacon Force, for instance, former MBA students of mine, a brilliant new venture where they're partnering with the Neuroscience Institute, and they're trying to figure out how to better motivate and stimulate people in work-like environments. That will create a lot of data on productivity, on what makes you tick, on what makes you happy and fulfilled, on what makes you productive. That's not just in an office environment, but also in other environments like the car, for instance. The average car that you will be transported in, whether it's autonomous or whether it is uh, 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 dri driven by you, will generate about 4,000 gigabits per day every day in the near future, okay? That is an unbelievable amount of data, and we have come full circle now to say, what are the different ways in which we look at how data, how more compute power, and how AI are now yielding different types of job environments, different types of productivity. The first way to look at it is the business model-based view. Companies are now changing business, and their business models are changing, which changes the pattern of consumption, which changes the pattern of work. You may now be in the gig economy, uh, you know, fitting smaller portions of your productive time into a large platform that is multi-sided, that changes how people consume what you bring to the table. Um, that is, of course, giving you a lot more flexibility, right? We also have to make sure that we give you the right skills at Halt, at Halt and Elsewhere in order for you to retain your own creative power. We want you to be really strong as you go into these new business and employment models so that you have control over what the value is of your contribution and how much you can demand for that value. In other words, how you set your salary or your fees. Or your, or your fees. So we need to make sure that as you become ever more measurable, you do not become a robot. We don't want you to become a robot and go head to head with machines. It's a competition we cannot win, right? So this is, for instance, a hotel in Japan, which has uh, arrived at 70% um, of um, uh, cost reduction by employing all robots. These are robots in Japan that are helping take care of elderly, right? So the question here is, are these jobs going to go away? Japan has a problem with uh, elder care. They, they are lacking about a million people uh, in the caretaking industries. So it's very natural that they would be one of the first ones to create some of these robots, okay? So is this going to mean that our jobs are going to go away? So I'm going to launch a poll that I'm showing you here. I want you to tell me whether you think your jobs will be uh, impacted 25%, 50%, 
75, sorry, that was supposed to read 75% uh, or 100%, okay? And so I'm gonna launch the poll and I would like you uh, to, uh, to, please, uh, to please answer it. You should be seeing it here. Uh, Stephen, if that's not the case, please do let me know. Yeah, it worked. Excellent, okay. Ah, great. I'm seeing responses, not just uh, not just here on the poll, but also in the chat box, right? Demet, for instance, saying 100% positive way, right? That's a very optimistic outlook here. And, uh, and of course, very aspirational, right? I would love for this to have 100% impact that is positive. And I want to be part of the picture and helping you get there, okay? So we have about 76% of people responding inching our way up to 80%. I think that's sufficient. I think most of you are saying, well, you know, it's probably a mixed picture. 50% of my job may be impacted, okay? And I can totally appreciate that. Let me share the poll. Yes, here we are, right? So now uh, you can see it. 50% of you, I'm sorry, 35% uh, of you have said 50% impact or thereabout, which means it's a mixed picture. And in fact, we are seeing a mixed picture, right? So let me dive right in and, um, uh, and go back to our slide uh, and see where, where that leaves us, okay? So are we, in fact, seeing, going to see massive job losses, massive impact and disruption of your jobs? Uh, you've seen some of these numbers, you know, that were meanwhile dismissed that said, well, 40% of all jobs will be going away by whatever it was, 2030, which is not that far away. It's 10 years. And of course, that has been debunked. That is a way too simplistic picture. The truth of the matter is we don't know for sure. Some people are saying 16%. Other people are saying 47%. McKinsey was saying, which I think is very realistic, you know, 60% of all tasks um, uh, sixty percent of all jobs will have thirty percent task change. Okay, uh, that still means, however, that we need to put three hundred forty-seven million, according to McKinsey, workers through job retraining. Right, and we're going to get to that in just a second. So this is the job-based view. We do not believe that all of these human jobs are going to go away. The truth is probably somewhere between uh, sixteen and thirty percent. Uh, of all jobs uh, needing retraining and displacement or replacement. But there are much more nuanced ways of looking at it. There is, for instance, the, uh, the uh, task-based view that really, as McKinsey said, 30% of your job tasks will be disrupted, okay? So you guys that answered about 50%, you know, we're probably a little bit, um, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit aggressive on that, but that's a good thing. You want to be productively paranoid, right? And get ahead of the eight ball, okay? So for instance, the banker, the job of a banker is not going to go away, but the profile of a banker will change. Think about what a banker does. The banker uh, creates a transaction environment. Yes, that might blockchain and artificial intelligence coming together, especially when quantum computing kicks in. But the banker also creates trust and relationships. Blockchain can help with trust, but at some point for certain types of financial transactions, the banker as a human being, as a counselor, as a coach, as an advisor that is trusted, that will stay in place. So we're going to have to make sure that if you are a banker that you emphasize more of the soft qualities of the emotional intelligence, and that's exactly what we're doing at Holt. We are pairing some of our degrees with emotional intelligence tracks in which you can hone your skills there as well to make you more productive and sustainable. Amelia here, for instance, is a secretarial bot. Of course, she is not going to replace all secretaries, but she may be displacing 30 or 40 percent of all the duties that a secretary has today, such that hopefully the secretary can devote herself to higher level, more complex tasks, such as pulling together very complex types of meetings and events, uh, or preparing different types of reports, or counseling managers on how to better navigate 
in organizational environments because we all know that administrative assistants, executive assistants are very good at that stuff, but they don't have enough time in their day to do this. The next base, the next view is the skills-based view. And I have to tell you, that's, I think, much more promising than the other two views that we discussed, like the business model and the job view and the task-based view, uh, really three models, because the skills-based view has the advantage of letting you focus on that which gives you the greatest optionality across your job trajectory, because skills are needed for a wide array of tasks, for a wide array of jobs, and for a wide array of business models. So when we at Hulk focus on skills, on tools, on frameworks, we are focusing on the one asset that will help you become more resilient even when your job goes away or even when a large portion of your job has to get rejiggered. The skills may still be valuable across other tasks and jobs. Now we have to be careful, and this is something where I agree, uh, uh, where I agree with uh, Kai Fu Lee. Uh, he and I introduced our books in the United States at the same time. We know each other, and we present it together, and we agree that it's actually more white white collar labor than blue collar labor that is threatened. What you see here is a McKinsey um, a graphic that shows you that really uh, automation of the cost through AI is hitting developed economies uh, or those that are focusing on high-end skills that are more intellectual, that are more knowledge-based, much harder than the ones that are focused on physical labor. Why? Because rolling out robots that have enough manual dexterity and physical intelligence to displace a true blue-collar worker happens more slowly than pushing AI out there through the pipes of the internet that could automate some of your thinking tasks. So we, you and I, as blue collar workers, as professionals, need to be careful and need to act fast. Time is of the essence here, and we are, including myself, already retooling and reskilling. This also tells you that the countries in green uh, here, uh, as you see a lot of the developed countries, uh, and, and uh, industrialized countries that are already very, very digital are still, still very much, if you toggle back to the other slide, those are the countries in green that we're showing in the upper right-hand corner. So being just digital does not do the trick. You need to do more. And in our humble opinion, and this is borrowed from Kai Fu Lee, as the source uh, reference says, you have to become... Um, in the, you have to put yourself in either the human veneer or the safe zone. Those are jobs that are creativity-based, that are strategy-based, that are socially-based, right? Everything that is north here uh, of, of the horizontal axis is where you should be. And that means you have to hone a combination of analytical database skills, machine learning skills, STEM skills, which is what we're doing at Hult. We're offering these combinations. You have to pair that with the human skill in order to become more defensible because that's where the robots and the chatbots and the AI cannot go just now. So stay away from the lower half, the danger zone and the slow creep that is not socially focused and move yourself through upskilling, through your education into the upper half. This is what I have said uh, in my op-ed in Wired Magazine. Unfortunately, the US government is not asking fast enough, acting fast enough. Some other governments in Europe, Singapore, elsewhere are acting much faster and I applaud them for it. But your professors at HALT are going out there and advocating for this now. We need more upskilling on this combination, on this symbiosis, between humans and machines. And that is exactly For the where we are, okay? Um, so we need to enact this symbiosis. What does that mean? Well, uh, more shocks happen like coronavirus. We have to understand that the world on the left here is locally physical. We will be living in a world that is locally physical and globally more virtual. It's not black and white. We will still travel, of course. We will still be the global generation that gets on airplanes. But we will be doing things more safely locally, physically, 
and more virtually globally. I think that goes without saying. So what you see on the left here are safe physical jobs, you know, a bit of a caricature, right? Hopefully you'll enjoy it. In the upper left, that's a restaurant in uh, the Netherlands. And the lower left, I believe, is in China. And on the right here, you see, uh, you know, Star Wars holograms, and you see uh, some of the latest uh, um, virtual augmented reality here uh, that, is being, uh, that is being stood up and innovated on by large internet companies in uh, the United States and elsewhere, of course, China, uh, notably. What you see in the middle is actually the physical self of you uh, in the physical environment. That's the left face you're seeing. The right face, it's, it's stunning. The right face is a computer representation of the actual face on the left. You can no longer tell the difference. Now, once that happens and gets rolled out, you can do almost physical meetings in the middle with something that looks like you. And it may not be you because we want to keep you safe from viruses, but it looks like you, it feels like you, it will talk like you, and you will be the person behind the curtain steering it. Just in that manner, we need to decide in every productive process, where is the human behind the curtain? Where's the human in the mix? In what part of our value chains every day at work does the human play the biggest role vis-a-vis -vis the machine? And what types of work do we leave to the machine? With that, I'm coming to the close here. As we are looking at Symbio Intelligence, I need you to focus on the stuff that's on the left, okay? I need you to focus on uh, being emotionally self-aware, on ideation, on inspiration, on leadership, on sense-making, on conceptualizing, on theory development, human intimacy, very, very important, right? Understanding the fears and anxieties and aspirations of people around you as you lead them. Empathy and love, right? Yes, it might sound a little schmaltzy, but it's not. It is so valuable because at the end of the day, we all want to relate to others. We are social beings. And then, of course, things like working with your hands uh, is very important still as well. So the things on the left are very defensible. As you get yourself into productive relationships with machine, these uh, machine makers are showing here in these images, you have to be good at being human. It is not enough to call yourself a human being, right? You have experienced bad call center uh, uh, experiences when you call customer service. You have experienced doctors who have bad bedside manner. You need to get better. We all need to get better at the human aspects, the humane aspects of our lives. And of course, at the same time, get better at STEM and at data. Both here needs to be part of the same picture. And that's what we offer at HALT. At the same time, ethics and values play a really key role as you think about this, as you think about this next step in your education, think about your value system. What kind of life do you want to lead in this state of symbiosis, in this cognitive era, okay? And then think about how you can configure your education at HALT or elsewhere to make that happen. But always, please always be values driven. Be true to who you are, okay? Because there is more than just making money. Money is important, but money is a hygiene factor. We want to empower you to lead satisfactory, purposeful, and successful lives. With that said, remember human machine symbiosis. Remember that you are critical to the future of work and that you shouldn't give in to wrong visions of competing with machines, but rather see yourself as an immensely valuable and very unique asset in this symbiotic relationship. So with that said, I thank you for your attention. Connect with me on LinkedIn if you like, but please tell me in the invitation that this is where you met me and I shall accept. And of course, I very much hope to meet you in the fall and beyond as you come to halt on one of our campuses it is my pleasure to coach you and guide you into this journey of the future of work if you let me. And please do, if you do come to our campuses, let me know that you have arrived. Okay, with that said, back over to you, Stephen.